Woman in Socialism by August Bebel. Introduction. We are living in an age of great social transformations that are steadily progressing. In all strata of society, we perceive an unsettled state of mind and an increasing re restlessness, denoting a marked tendency toward profound and radical changes. Many questions have arisen and are being discussed with growing interest in ever widening circles. One of the most important of these questions and one that is constantly coming into greater prominence is the woman question. The woman question deals with the position that women should hold in our social organism and seeks to determine how she can best develop her powers and her abilities in order to become a useful member of human society endowed with equal rights and serving society according to her best capacity. From our point of view, this question coincides with that other question. In what manner should society be organized to abolish oppression, exploitation, misery and need, and to bring about the physical and mental welfare of individuals and of society as a whole? To us then, the woman question is only one phase of the general social question that at present occupies all intelligent minds. Its final solution can only be attained by removing social extremes and the evils which are a result of such extremes. Nevertheless, the woman question demands our special consideration. What the position of woman has been in ancient society, what her position is today, and what it will be in the coming social order are questions that deeply concern at least one half of humanity. Indeed, in Europe, they concern a majority of organized society because women constitute a majority of the population. Moreover, the prevailing conceptions concerning the development of women's social position during successive stages of history are so faulty that enlightenment on this subject has become a necessity. Ignorance concerning the position of woman chiefly accounts for the prejudice that, that the women's movement has to connect with among all classes of people, by no means least among the women themselves. Many even venture to assert that there is no woman question at all, since woman's position has always been the same and will remain the same in the future, because nature has destined her to be a wife and a mother and to confine her activities to the home. Everything that is beyond the four narrow walls of her home and is not closely connected with her domestic duties is not supposed to concern her. In the woman question, then, we find two contending parties, just as in the labor question, which relates to the position of the working man in human society. Those who wish to maintain everything as it is are quick to relegate women to her so-called natural profession, believing that they have thereby settled the whole matter. They do not recognize that millions of women are not placed in a position enabling them to fulfill their natural function of wifehood and motherhood, owing to reasons that we shall discuss at length later on. They furthermore do not recognize that to millions of other women, their natural profession is a failure because to them marriage has become a yoke and a condition of slavery, and they are obliged to drag on their lives in misery and despair. But these wiseacres are no more concerned by these facts than by the fact that in various trades and professions, millions of women are exploited far beyond their strength and must slave away their lives for a meager subsistence. They remain deaf and blind to these disagreeable truths as they remain deaf and blind to the misery of the proletariat, consoling themselves and others by the false assertion that it has always been thus and will always continue to be so. That woman is entitled, as well as man, to enjoy all the achievements of civilization, to lighten her burdens, to improve her condition, and to develop all her physical and mental qualities, they refuse to admit. When furthermore told that women to enjoy full physical and mental freedom should also be economically independent, should no longer depend for subsistence upon the goodwill and favor of the other sex, the limit of their patience will be reached. Indignantly, they will pour forth a bitter indictment of the madness of the age and its crazy attempts at emancipation. These are the old ladies of, the, of both sexes who cannot overcome the narrow circle of their prejudices. 
They are the human owls that dwell wherever darkness prevails and cry out in terror whenever a ray of light is cast into their agreeable gloom. Others do not remain quite as blind to the eloquent facts. They confess that at no time woman's position has been so unsatisfactory in comparison to general social progress as it is as it is in present. They recognize that it is necessary to investigate how the condition of the self-supporting woman can be improved, but in the case of married women, they believe the social problem to be solved. They favor the admission of unmarried women only into a limited number of trades and professions. Others again are more advanced and insist that competition between the sexes should not be limited to the inferior trades and professions, but should be extended to all higher branches of learning and the arts and sciences as well. They demand equal educational opportunities and that women should be admitted to all institutions of learning, including the universities. They also favor the appointment of women to government positions, pointing out the results already achieved by women in such positions, especially in the United States. A few are even coming forward to demand equal political rights for women. Woman, they argue, is a human being and a member of organized society as well as man, and the very fact that men have until now framed and administered the laws to suit their own purposes and to hold women in subjugation proves the necessity of women's participation in public affairs. It is noteworthy that all these various endeavors do not go beyond the scope of the present social order. The question is not propounded whether any of these proposed reforms will accomplish a decisive and essential improvement in the condition of women. According to the conceptions of bourgeois or capitalistic society, the civic equality of men and women is deemed an ultimate solution of the woman question. People are either unconscious of the fact or deceive themselves in regards to it, that the admission of women to trades and industries is already practically ab accomplished and is being strongly favored by the ruling classes in their own interest. But tender prevailing conditions, women's invasion of industry has the detrimental effect of increasing competition on the labor market, and the result is a re reduction in wages for both male and female workers. It is clear then that this cannot be a satisfactory solution. Men who favor these endeavors of women within the scope of present society, as well as the bourgeois women who are active in the movement, consider complete civic equality of women the ultimate goal. These men and women then differ radically from those who, in their narrow-mindedness, oppose the movement. They differ radically from those men who are actuated by petty motives of selfishness and fear of competition, and therefore try to prevent women from obtaining higher education and from gaining admission to the better paid professions. But there is no difference of class between them, such as exists between the worker and the capitalist. If the bourgeois suffragists would achieve their aim and would bring about equal rights for men and women, they would still fail to abolish that sex slavery which marriage, in its present form, is, is to countless numbers of women. They would fail to abolish prostitution. They would fail to abolish the economic dependence of wives. To the great majority of women, it also remains a matter of indifference whether a few thousand members of their sex, belonging to the more favored class of society, obtain higher learning and enter some learned profession, or hold a public office. The general condition of the sex as a whole is not altered thereby. The female sex as such has a double yoke to bear. Firstly, women suffer as a result of their social dependence upon men and the inferior position allotted to them in society. Formal equality before the law alleviates this condition but does not remedy it. Secondly, women suffer as a result of their economic dependence, which is the lot of women in general, and especially of the proletarian women, as it is of the proletarian men. We see then that all women, regardless of their social position, represent that sex which during the evolution of society has been oppressed and wronged by the other sex, and therefore it is to the common interest of all women to remove their disabilities by changing the laws and institutions of the present state and social order. But a great majority of women is furthermore deeply and personally concerned in a complete reorganization of the present state and social order, which has for its purpose the abolition of wage slavery, 
which at present weighs most heavily upon the women of the proletariat, as also the abolition of sex slavery, which is closely connected with our industrial conditions and our system of private ownership. The women who are active in the bourgeois suffrage movement do not recognize the necessity of so complete a transformation. Influenced by their privileged social position, they consider the more radical aims of the proletarian women's movement dangerous doctrines that must be opposed. The class antagonism that exists between the capitalist and working class, and that is increasing with the growth of industrial problems, also clearly manifests itself then within the women's movement. Still, these sister women, though antagonistic to each other on class lines, have a great many more points in common than the men engaged in the class struggle, and though they march in separate armies, they may strike a united blow. This is true in, regar in regard to all endeavors pertaining to equal rights of women under the present social order, that is, her right to enter any trade or profession adapted to her strength and ability, and her right to civic and political equality. These are, as we shall see, very important and very far-reaching aims. Besides striving for these aims, it is in the particular interest of proletarian women to work hand-in-hand -hand with proletarian men for such measures and institutions that tend to protect the working woman from physical and mental degeneration, and to preserve her health and strength for normal, normal fulfillment of her maternal functions. Furthermore, it is the duty of the proletarian woman to join the men of her class in the struggle for a thoroughgoing transformation of society, to bring about an order that by its social institutions will enable both sexes to enjoy complete economic and intellectual independence. Our goal then is not only to achieve equality of men and women under the present social order, which constitutes the sole aim of the bourgeois women's movement, but to go far beyond this and to remove all barriers that make one human being dependent upon another, which includes the dependence of one sex upon the other. This solution of the woman question is identical with the solution of the social question. They who seek a complete solution of the woman question must therefore join hands with those who have inscribed upon their banner the solution of the social question in the interest of all mankind, the socialists. The Socialist Party is the only one that has made the full equality of women, their liberation from every form of depend dependence and oppression, an integral part of its program. Not for reasons of propaganda, but from necessity. For there can be no liberation of mankind without social independence and equality of the sexes. All socialists will probably agree with the fundamental principles herein expressed, but the same cannot be said in regard to the manner in which we picture the realization of our ultimate aims, that is, in regard to the particular form that institutions should take to bring about that desired independence and equality for all. As soon as we forsake the firm foundation of reality, and begin to depict the future, there is a wide field for spe speculation. A difference of opinion immediately arises as to what is probable or improbable. Whatever, therefore, is stated in this book concerning future probabilities must be regarded as the personal opinion of the author, and eventual attacks must be directed against his person, because he assumes full responsibility for his statements. Attacks that are honestly meant and are objective in character will be welcome. Those that distort the contents of this book or are founded upon an untruthful interpretation of their meaning will be ignored. It remains to be said that in the following chapters, all conclusions should be drawn, which become necessary for us to draw as a result of our investigation of facts. To be unprejudiced is the first requirement for a recognition of the truth and only by expressing without reserve that which is and that which is to be can we attain our ends.